be recording. Okay. Along with many other accomplishments, he's currently president of Bankers Trust Company of Des Moines. He's a general partner of Gar Seed Company, and he's a nationally recognized expert of Soviet agriculture. I could go on and on talking about the accomplishments he's had dealing with American agriculture, Soviet agriculture, and communicating back and forth, but that's what we have our guest lecturer here for today, giving his expertise on some of the different situations. So please join me in welcoming John Crystal. I'm pleased to be here today and, uh, and to see such a nice crowd. That's a, that's a rewarding thing for a person who comes to speak. I, uh, I have been going around the state of Iowa talking about U.S.-Soviet relations, and I intend to change that slightly today uh, because I, I, I think things are happening in the state of Iowa which have to do uh, with that relationship that, that you people are going to be involved with. I ought to give some, some of my credentials. I graduated, if you can stand to hear it, from that other school, um, <laughs> and uh, came back to Coon Rapids and farmed for 10 years. My brother graduated from this school and came home, and we were partners and, and still are. Um, sometime after we were farming together, uh, we decided that uh, one manager would be better than two, and uh, he lost the toss, and, uh, or won it. And so uh, I sought a job in a bank, and due to those two great isms of America, capitalism and nepotism, I became the president of the local bank. My father nominated me, and my brother seconded, and my cousins voted for me. <laughs> now I'm the president of Bankers Trust in Des Moines, which is a terrifying experience because I'm not related to a single director. <laughs> and uh, I'm on my, on my own, and it's very lonely. Uh, I would like to start by talking slightly about the state of Iowa. I think there is a profound change taking place in the state of Iowa, uh, and one which is difficult and one which needs a solution. You know, as Neil Harrell and others have said, that 30% that of the farmers are in some kind of economic trouble. 30% could be in trouble, and 30% have never had it so good. Uh, they have no debt at all, and they're taking whatever money they have and putting it in time CDs or government bonds, and the world is a wonderful place. If the 30% who are in serious trouble uh, get in more serious trouble, and the amount of land uh, that I think will come on the market, in fact does, in that whirlpool that they create comes the second rung of people. And the people who are in economic difficulty today are not people who were mismanaged, who participated in mismanagement or were drunks or had some kind of family trouble. Uh, the people are church elders and school board members and, and leading members of their community. And it is a serious thing. It's not only the farmers that are in trouble. It is the small town merchants and the county seat merchants and the people who supply agriculture are in trouble. It's the coast to coast dealer and the, and the store which my grandfather started in Coon Rapids, which isn't going broke but isn't making any money and in fact uh, will suffer some loss. What this means to the state of Iowa is that, that the good towns, I was in Carroll this morning, an excellent town, and if those smaller towns are injured, uh, then fewer people uh, will be leaving Coon Rapids to buy their groceries on Saturday night in Carroll or to go to the, grocery, to the clothing store uh, for clothes or whatever, the, the small percentage of them that do. I saw the other day in Fort Dodge uh, a very fine extension agent of Iowa State University, a fellow named Clarence Rice. And 15 years ago, uh, my grandfather's store um, either had to be remodeled or it was so crummy we had, we had to close it up or do something different. So I asked the extension service to appraise whether or not that money ought to be spent. And Clarence came and said, either way, he couldn't tell. It, uh, he, wasn't, he didn't say we shouldn't, and he wasn't promoting doing it. If he came to that store today and looked it over, I think there would be no question. So 
What I'm saying is that the state of Iowa, and I think the United States, uh, has an economic difficulty and a change about it um, that we need to do something about, but first of all, we need to recognize. Now, what's caused that difficulty? Obviously, the difficulty in agriculture is caused by the 14 percent interest that they're charging at Bankers Trust and in Coon Rapids a day to farmers. If you charge people 14 percent interest in an inter industry that earns somewhere between three and five, uh, you are participating in some kind of, of murder uh, because uh, uh, the, the farmer, if he owes very much money, uh, simply can't pay 14 percent interest uh, while he's earning three. It's, uh, it's, it would take some kind of economic miracle for that to happen. So the interest rate is devastatingly high. The dollar is high priced. The high priced dollar is caused by the by a high interest rate and by the uh, very large deficit uh, uh, that we have. The, the trade balance uh, is, is the worst in history and has been a deficit for us for a long period of time. So there is that extreme difficulty uh, for United States agriculture and I think for the United States today. In addition to that, I think we need to look abroad. And another strange thing has happened. For years, the United States has had a good agricultural technology uh, since World War II and slightly before that, with the use of fertilizers and herbicides and insecticides and, and better genetics and better machinery and the education uh, that we have behind all of those things. The rest of the world is catching on. Uh, the nation of India is practically, if not uh, actually, uh, self-sufficient in food. Not self-sufficient in a luxurious diet, but self-sufficient for a, for a, for a diet of, of, of bare subsistence. And that is an enormous change. Um, large parts of Asia uh, are self-sufficient for more than a subsistence diet. I would predict that the nation of Egypt uh, will not be too far away. Uh, they can t you can take nitrogen fertilizer. I can remember that uh, uh, my uncle was a, my uncle Roswell Garst was an enormous uh, supporter of the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And, and so to prove his point, he would take uh, uh, in-gate cedars or sprayers and put a big in on a hillside in a pasture uh, that was practically bare. And like magic, would come four or five, ten times as much grass as came before. Nitrogen fertilizer is an easy thing. All you have to do is have some way to get it on the ground, and it simply multiplies uh, the production. It is, a, it is a magical thing to people who've not had it before. Uh, and irrigation. Uh, one of the things that foreign countries can do is build dams uh, uh, so that there is an enormous amount of, of uh, water available for irrigation in, in dry areas. Genetics has become uh, much more specific and, um, and, and does great things for local areas and, and local conditions. This institution has had a lot to do uh, with that uh, growth of production around the world, and it is, a, it is a proud moment for the state of Iowa to realize that uh, this institution has contributed so greatly uh, to the betterment of, uh, of mankind. But the difficulty is that now we are serving, I think, in the next generation, a different kind of a market. Uh, we're not feeding or giving food uh, to people who cannot uh, produce their own food in a substantial part of the world. That seems a strange thing uh, to say when, when the pictures every day are of Ethiopia and Mozambique and, and that part of the world who, who literally are starving to death uh, by the tens of thousands. But in fact, the world is much better able to produce its food than it was before. So that we need to look at a new kind of market, that market which, which will be served for better than a subsistence diet. Uh, I think uh, there's nothing the matter with that market, and in fact, I think it is enormous. Uh, but <coughs> it, uh, it means that uh, our technology has paid off and that we will export technology and food, uh, grains, for a better diet and a more luxurious diet for the world abroad. That brings me then in a part of the circle to the Soviet Union. I have been going there for 25 years, 20 years, and 25 years, and uh, I've gone every other year at the invitation of the Soviets to, um, 
to look at their agriculture and to hopefully constructively uh, criticize their agriculture so that they could uh, produce uh, uh, more agricultural products. It's hard work. I go to Moscow the first day, and the first time I went was in 1960. I'd never been east of Chicago, and that was the summer that they shot down the U-2 plane um, so that uh, I was a frightened uh, young farmer uh, when I got off the plane in Moscow. But it has been an enjoyable experience and an educational experience for me, and I hope beneficial to the Soviets. I land in Moscow the first day and take instantly to the country where I visit uh, farms and uh, confinement housing and uh, mach machinery factories and fertilizer factories and seed corn plants and everything having to do with agriculture and must sing for my supper. I speak to one group at breakfast, one at lunch, one at dinner, uh, and sleep in a different bed every night. Uh, very seldom go back to the same place so that I have been, I would suspect that I've seen as much of the Soviet Union as, uh, as any other American. And um, I suspect that, that uh, I have n know a broader group of, of Soviets over the whole country than most other Americans. I've, I've known people so long that I knew them before they were married, uh, when they had children, and now when they're grandchildren, uh, when they are grandparents, so that uh, I have old and dear friends in the country, and dear friends in spite of, of their difference with me or my difference with them in ideology. The Soviets are having a, a very difficult time, as are we. Uh, they're spending 30 percent of their of their national budget on arms, and the United States is spending about 30 percent on arms. We're spending as much a percentage of our, of our national budget on arms as we did at the time of the Vietnamese War, uh, and they are spending as much as they have ever spent. But um, uh, it is perhaps somewhat different for, the, for, for them. They've had a terrible episode with wars in, in the uh, centuries of, of Russian and and Soviet existence. They have been whipped by everybody, invaded by everybody. Uh, they've had three victories. They beat uh, Charles V of Sweden hundreds of years ago, uh, after he was in the country quite a few years. Uh, they whipped Napoleon, and they whipped Hitler. Hitler got into the country as far as from, from New York to Chicago. 85% uh, of the housing was destroyed. The schools were destroyed. Uh, the animals were destroyed. The machinery was destroyed in a country that was just, uh, just emerging from being a, almost a backward country. And so they had to start all over in, 19, um, in 1944. Uh, they paid a terrible price. And if they have the history that I, you know as well as I, that they have with regard to war, uh, that means a lot to them. I don't know of a single family uh, that doesn't have some tragic, personal, immediate thing that they can tell you about World War II. Um, I have a friend named, uh, named Lydia Spinakova. Uh, somebody asked her about me to asked me about her today. Uh, I've been in her apartment lots of times. Uh, her father's always there and her children and her mother's not. And her mother's not there because she was a tail gunner in a bomber which was shot down and she is so disfigured she won't meet a, a uh, foreigner. But she lived. There is no family that doesn't know from personal experience the horror of war and not just the death of the war, uh, which killed 60 Soviets for every American who died, uh, but the aftermath of war, the fact that there was no housing, um, the fact that, uh, that they had to pick themselves up in a, in a, in a world uh, which was not necessarily friendly to them. And and start to go again. So that for their interest, they need to stop the arms race. Uh, they're putting so much money into the arms race that they're unable to increase their standard of living uh, at the, in the amount which uh, they would like to have and which would, generally speaking, be acceptable to them. Uh, they're increasing their standard of living a, a couple of percent a year. Uh, and maybe that will even be less. 
because they're draining so much of the talent of the country, of the educated people and the steel and the technology of the country and putting it into defense. Uh, they pay for their defense, generally speaking, on a cash and carry basis. And it is a hurtful, a damaging thing for their future. Um, but with the history they have of war uh, and the cost of victories even to them, uh, we need to understand that the Russian citizen will stand popularly for any sacrifice and any cost so long as he sees that expenditure as defense. And they have a greater opportunity to see it as defense than we do uh, because it's been 120 years since there was a war on Soviet, on American soil. And it took, uh, and it was on a relatively small part of the, of the uh, geographic area of the United States, and it took 75 years for that uh, part of the country to economically recover. Um, I think um, that they would be anxious to find some accord uh, in that kind of money that they are spending. Unfortunately, both sides want uh, to be equal, and equal to them means a little bit more, uh, uh, both sides. The United States economy is um, the exact opposite. Since Lyndon Johnson uh, started to get us involved in the, in the war in Vietnam, we have had guns and butter, and uh, we're doing all ours with a Visa card. Uh, we are pushing those costs into the future, and we are spending as, as much today uh, as we spent at the, at the end of the Vietnamese War as a percentage of our national budget. What is that doing to us to continue the curve? It means that we're borrowing enormous amounts of money from ourselves and from foreigners. And it means that that demand for money, which at this very moment there's a huge rollover of debt, uh, pushes up that interest rate. And as that interest rate is pushed up, the dollar is high. And consequently, what we're doing is injuring severely the farmer and I think the rest of the economy. Um, and we are hindering the ability uh, to export products abroad. Um, in 1960s, then Secretary McNamara said that 30 nuclear warheads uh, would render the Soviet Union impotent. Today, the two countries have 30,000 nuclear warheads between them, and we are manufacturing them at the rate of 100 a week uh, between us. Um, that is a foolish thing, and it is a, it is a foolish idea when my whole relationship started with the Soviets in the 1950s because the Des Moines Register wrote an editorial and said, let's compete on food and not compete on arms. I'm now 30 years older than that, and we have escalated that race and escalated the cost and are spending so much money that we are destroying our economy, which is the very thing we intend to defend. Uh, we have a, we have a, a self-defeating uh, proposition. We need to export to them, uh, which I, because I think they're an enormous market. The, the Soviets can live perfectly well on cabbage and potatoes and bread, of which they produce an awful lot. Uh, what they need and what they want is more of the luxury foods. Uh, they're not starving to death. They're going to bed every night fat because they're eating too much carbohydrate. What they like is a richer diet, and we ought to be anxious to give it to them. Uh, I can remember being a small farm kid in Coon Rapids. Uh, I didn't dream that I'd ever be standing here talking to a, to a bunch of college students and college graduates, or that I would be uh, president of Bankers Trust Company, or that I would be going to the Soviet Union. As you succeed or become wealthy, your desires increase geometrically, not arithmetically. And I think you ought to be able to decide that about yourself. Um, I'm always, every time I see a young person with one of those things on their ears, jogging in shorts and a t-shirt, I think that that is something that the world could live without. Uh, but it was necessary, it was necessary to the person who bought it. And there's nothing the matter with that. Uh, I think that as the Soviets, become good customers, they will become better customers, 
and they can pay for it. I think we ought to be very interested in that, and we ought to be interested in having them have a better diet. When people are not successful in what they wish, and they want to be mad at somebody, they almost never look in the mirror. Uh, they look at somebody uh, to blame uh, the trouble on. And uh, who better to blame it on than the, than the uh, other superpower? I think, uh, I don't pretend that the Soviets and the United States will be pals. Uh, they, don't, they don't have to be. All they have to do is get along. And if they can get along, uh, I think it is materially and economically uh, good for the United States. I think that they are two things at once. They're isolationists so far as their own country is concerned. That's why they have seized that buffer from Poland to Afghanistan around their country. Foolish idea since the missiles can, can uh, <coughs> cross those, those satellites in five minutes and be either in Western Europe or, or Western Soviet uh, Union. So what they're doing is expensive, but, but a part of their culture. And um, uh, we, we've just got to do something about it. I think then that I would, I would uh, tell you that I see two things that I think the United States uh, has an obligation to do. And one of them, I believe, has to do with this university and other land-grant colleges. Um, we are in tough economic times, and part of the reason that we're in those tough economic times is because um, corn in Iowa makes 130, 140 bushels the acre, and soybeans make 40 bushels of the acre, and hogs are sold in five or uh, six months, and there aren't any more two-year-old cattle being fed to finish, and you can carry a cow and a calf per acre. This state of Iowa is like magic, it is so productive. And, uh, and this college has make, helped make it so to its, this university, to its great credit. But uh, we compound that success with the success of the rest of the world, a temporary, uh, a temporary success of being only able to feed themselves barely uh, with a serious problem. We have an agricultural program uh, today which is based on um, 30 bushel average national corn yield and no soybeans and eight month fattening hogs and the fattening of two year old cattle. And um, uh, relatively speaking, a very productive place. Um, and we solved those problems, Franklin Roosevelt, with the, with the agricultural acts of the 1930, which have been fiddled with and, and changed but essentially we're operating uh, with, the, with the same agricultural governmental uh, solutions as we did then. And we've got to have something different. We now have this marvelous technology that's come out of this age of science since World War II. And, and we have tripled, um, quadrupled, the production of some um, agricultural products in the United States. And uh, we need to export or do something with or not produce 25 or 30 percent of the agricultural production in the United States. The Soviets lose 15 to 20 percent between the field and the table because they don't have on-farm storage. They don't have a, a infrastructure. Um, they don't have that investment that we've made in agriculture in the last uh, 40 years. If we could just transfer those two things, uh, what, a, what a wonderful world it would be. But obviously, we're going to have to do something, uh, and, and the doing something isn't going to be cutting back on the inputs into agriculture. We've got to have a new farm, a new farm program in this country, or we're going to have agricultural economic disaster. Uh, there are two solutions. Uh, one is to export, and I don't think we can do that in the amount uh, uh, that, we, that we ought to. And the other is to come with a, with a new farm program. And what I would really challenge you people to do, I think it's going to be five, ten years in the making. Uh, I can remember talking uh, to Carl Hamilton, who just retired here, and have him tell me about the thrilling time in the 30s that he took part in the development of that program. 
you people need to be thinking about it. You need to graduate from college and involve yourself in a new direction uh, for agriculture, and you'll be the, the, I can't guarantee that you'll be Carl Hamilton, um, but be a participant in, the, in that program. The other thing we need to do is to find honorable accord with the Soviet Union, who I see as an enormous customer for money of our agricultural pro uh, products. And not only an enormous customer now, but a customer who will, who will increase in their desires. Um, they cut 85% of their corn for silage. Uh, we cut 15. The reason they cut 85 is because of their early frost. One year out of three, they have a drought. Um, uh, they need the things necessary to give them an ever-increasing richer diet. And we ought to be happy to do that for them. Uh, we need to find accord with the Soviet Union on the arms race because we're going to destroy our own economy if we don't. If we're spending 30 percent of our uh, national budget on defense, we can't stand that, and we can't stand it over a prolonged period of time. I, in addition, don't think that other parts of the economy can stand 12 to 15 percent interest. Uh, this current uh, boom in the economy, uh, I question. It's not in the manufacture of cement. It's not in the manufacture of steel. It's not in the production of lumber. It is a consumer uh, boom, and that is a kind of a boom that doesn't have a very uh, broad base. If you will, that is, that is a thing that you do as a citizen um, to participate uh, in that movement toward finding some kind of honorable accord. As an educated person and an interested citizen, you ought to participate in the drive toward a new kind of agricultural economic program. Now, I'll just conclude by telling you that there's one thing I haven't said about the arms race and that I have not asked you to measure the arms race on a moral issue. The moral issue is obviously the most important part of the issue because we have the opportunity uh, to destroy people who are not in the military, who are not in the government, who are just people going home from work and coming home from work or asleep in their bed. What we can do by incinerating the world is an immoral thing. But I have not used that in my argument because I think that the practical and economic considerations for finding a solution to our economic difficulty uh, are to be found in the practical world in addition to the moral world. I wish I were 20 or 21 or 22 uh, because I think there is an exciting uh, challenge ahead of you, and I hope you take part in it. Thank you. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Crystal, for your marvelous insight into the situation and your uh, suggestions, and I'm not going to steal your watch there. <laughs> But we were trying to think of an appropriate gift for you and for uh, taking the time to come speak with us here. And when we went to the, uh, the engraving shop, we saw all sizes and shapes of plaques and figured your walls were already covered with such. So we came up with a unique idea. It's an <laughs> Iowa State College of Agriculture hat. So thank you. when you're going to work at Bankers Trust or working on your farm in Coon Rapids, I uh, hope you remember your time here and I'd like to thank you for speaking thank with you. us. Thank you. If you could stay around for just a couple more minutes, we have a few more details about Ag Week. First of all, I'd like to thank Charlie Cook, who arranged uh, Mr. Crystal's speech, Charlie. And also we have um, Ann Parrish, who would like to give some more details about Ag Week right now. And this will take just a couple minutes, so I appreciate it if you could stay. Thank you. As many of you know, the theme of this year's Ag Week was Catch Ag Spirit 84. Uh, we feel that we've had the best Ag Week in quite a long time. Uh, we started off Sunday with our annual volleyball tournament. This year we had 17 teams, which is an increase from last year's spring fling. And the winner of this year's volleyball tournament was a team from Alpha Gamma Rho. Is there a representative from the house or the team? This is our Ag Week volleyball trophy, and it's going to become a rotating trophy so that next year whoever wins will also get this trophy. On Monday, we had the official opening by President Parks, which was a 
one of the first times that he's ever really gotten involved with the students in something like this, and he signed in a proclamation for us. And then a bunch of us went over to Curtis Hall and hung up the Ag Week banner that many of you can see out there. And the Ag Week banner is going to be used as our spirit kind of award. Uh, we base that on a participation on Ag Week activities. On Tuesday, we had Ag Career Day, and I'd like to congratulate Josie Neiman and Dean Davidson on having the largest Ag Career Day ever. They had approximately 86 to 88 companies there, and a very large turnout throughout the day. I think more than just Ag students came. I think uh, people from other colleges at Iowa State, and we also noticed that there were some people from NIAC there, and other community colleges and so forth around the state of Iowa. Today, of course, we had our main speaker, Mr. John Crystal, and I think everybody really appreciated you coming up here. It was uh, quite informing for all of us. And um, that's about it for Ag Week. We'd like to uh, tell you that we have selected the Ag Spirit 84 winners. It was kind of a committee decision between the Ag Week committee and the Executive Council. And we'd like to congratulate the Ag Business Club on having the most spirit and participation in Ag Week. That's it. <laughs> And once again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming.